Welcome to another recorded lecture in the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Nikolsky and I'm the teacher and coordinator of this course. In the first part of the course, we learn an analytic method called textual theory, which we then use to analyze literature from the Middle East. We follow the introductory book describing this theory, which is called Textual Theory and Introduction, written by Joanna Gavins. And we use this approach to analyze short stories from the book Gaza Writes Back, an anthology of short stories compiled by Rifat al Arir. You can find links to the books in the description below. The second part of the course is dedicated to identity issues particular to the Palestinian society. Today, I talk about chapters eight and nine of the book, Textual Theory and Introduction by Joanna Gavins. Chapter eight is titled Narratives, and it talks about focalization, and especially about free indirect speech. All this, of course, will be explained. And chapter nine is titled Double Vision, and it talks about metaphors from a text world theory perspective. And this will be explained in the lecture as well, of course. I will look at each chapter separately, and then as usual, I will use uh, examples from the book Gaza Writes Back, an anthology of short stories compiled by Rifat al Arir. <laughs> So today we will review the two final thematic chapters of the book, Textual Theory and Introduction. What is common to these two chapters, in contrast to the last uh, three that we reviewed earlier, is that they do not focus on text worlds, which is the topic of text worlds, uh, typical for textual theory, but they focus on familiar narratological topics. Focalization refers to changes in the text that reveal that we are seeing or hearing a specific point of view through the words and not the neutral voice of an implied author. Chapter nine talks about metaphors. A metaphor is when something is described in terms of something else, such as time is money. This is a huge topic in narratology, in linguistics and in cultural cognition. Uh, has been so in the past uh, few decades. These two topics are, among other things, checked in relation to the notion of text worlds. And in both cases, an important differences between these notions and text worlds are pointed out. So chapter eight is called Narratives. We will be looking at the work of the types of narrators and the work of the narrator in general. We will learn about focalization, a concept that uh, relates to the question from whose point of view do we hear the story. For this, we will review the concept uh, of direct speech, indirect speech, and free indirect speech. These aspects are mostly concerned with uh, literary text, with literature, novels, and short stories, and less with other forms of discourse. We will start with an example. This is from the first volume of a much loved detective series focusing on the ladies detective agency of Mara Ramotswe from Botswana. Here is the author reading the first words of the first volume. I'm Alexander McCall Smith. I'm the author of the Number One Ladies Detective Agency series of books set here in Botswana. I'm writing the ninth book in the series, and I thought that I would get into one of these canoes and go off into the delta to see if there's anything here which might interest Mara Matswe. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mara Matsui had a detective agency in Africa, at the foot of Kali Hill. These were its assets, a tiny white van, two desks, two chairs, a telephone, and an old typewriter. Then there was a teapot in which Mara Matsui, the only lady private detective in Botswana, brewed red bush tea, and three mugs, one for herself, one for her secretary, and one for the client. What else does a detective agency really need? These are the opening lines of the first book in the very popular series about Ma Ramotswe, the Botswana detective, whom readers all over the world have taken to their hearts. The man behind the books is the Scottish author Alexander McCall Smith, who returns to Botswana every year in search of new mysteries for his leading lady to solve. Here is the text and an image of uh, Mara Ramotswe from a television series that was made uh, after this book. This narrator, as in most novels and literary fiction, is external to the story, an external narrator. A narrator, the, the term narrator is similar to the implied author in that it is the voice that tells the story, someone of whom in many cases, we know absolutely nothing, except that this is a voice that tells the story. In narratological terms, this is called a heterodiegetic narrator, someone who is outside the story and tells about what is happening to the characters, relating to them in the third person. If the narrator is a character in the story, even if only the character of the teller, such as someone saying, let me tell you about something that happened many years ago. This is a homodiegetic narrator who talks in the first person, yeah, let me, about him or herself, and in the third or sometimes second person about the other characters. When the narrator is heterodiegetic, external to the story, it is easier to establish an implied author image of someone with whom we share a split discourse world. Yeah, so he is an external, external as we are external. The reader feels that they hear the voice of a real person, this is the implied author, and the point of view they hear is that of a real person. The heterodiegetical narrator is therefore a go-between figure between the discourse world and the text world. He or she are an omniscient, all-knowing narrator who is relating to the world-building, uh, function-advancing elements, reporting the mental and ver verbal activities of the enactors, and thus makes the text world accessible to us. A homodiegetic narrator is an enactor inside a story not necessarily the protagonist, but inside the story, and they tell the story in the first person. Such a narrator does not have the existence in the split discourse world, but only in the text world. They tell themselves while they tell the story. Therefore, the first person homodiegetical style foregrounds the fictional nature of narrative the reader must make a double leap, first into the split discourse world, the world in the mind of the co-participant in the, in the discourse world, then to relate to the text world and the homodiegetic narrator there as a co-participant in the split discourse world, to trust the actor in the story as a narrator, as well as to trust what, what it is that they are telling they enact accessible worlds, their world building elements, function advancing elements, world switches, and so on. But with a homodiegetic narrator, the reader also hears a point of view from inside the story, of someone in the story. In this respect, it is much more revealing about the story itself. However, there is a way that a heterodiegetical narrator in the third person can pass on the point of view of an, an actor, of a character in the story. This is called focalization. He, he focuses the, the story through someone else's eyes. And its poetic technique is free indirect speech. 
as you know, direct speech in a text is conveying uh, what the enactor actually is saying. It is usually marked with uh, quotation marks, introduced with a verbal functioning advancing proposition by the teller, and repeats the words of the enactor. What we see here, Cynthia said, I have no idea what you are talking about. These are the words of Cynthia. And while she was saying this, she was thinking at the same time that the thing in question is nonsense. We know this because the narrator happened to tell this to us. This is not always the case. In indirect speech, we don't hear, so to speak, Cynthia's voice, but we hear the testimony of the narrator about uh, what Cynthia said. Cynthia had no idea what he was talking about. But there's a third way to report about Cynthia's point of view. It is called the free indirect speech, which you see here at the bottom. Cynthia had no idea what this nonsense was. So structurally and grammatically, it is a third person report. But in terms of the content of what is being said, and perhaps the, the lexical level or the lexical choice, the reader he can hear the voice of, the, of Cynthia, the enactor inside the story. The words, this nonsense, are the voice of Cynthia, even when someone else is saying them in the third, third person. If we, we go back to the example we saw earlier of the number one ladies detective agency, I'm quoting Gavins now on page 133. In McCall Smith's novel, says Gavins, the narrator is omniscient and occasion occasionally seems to dip into the mind of Mara Ramotswe, periodically giving the reader access to her thoughts. For example, have another look at the question which occurs at the end of the first paragraph. What else does a detective agency really need? There is a suggestion here that this is not a question being asked by the narrator, but by the main and actor in the, in the text world. This is Mara Ramotswe. The sense that another voice might be present in this uh, section of the discourse, that of Mama Ramotswe, is enhanced, for example, by the de detective-like listing of assets here, these are its assets, a tiny white van, two desks, two chairs, a telephone, and an old, and an old typewriter, as well as by the suggestion of the boastfulness in the declaration that she is the only lady private detective in Botswana. Readers are here being given a fleeting glimpse of Mara Ramotswe thought process. There is a name for the character in the text from whose point of view we hear the text. It is called focalizer. So we met quite a few concepts today already, and I want to make uh, some order between all of them. Let us start with the last one, focalizer. Uh, so the focalizer is the voice through which we hear the story. We get this voice's uh, point of view. Yeah? So this voice's point of view is how we hear the story. In most cases, this would be the narrator, the teller of the story. The narrator is conceptualized by us, the readers, in most cases, as an implied author. Yeah? So we hear the narrator's voice and we understand that the, narr uh, the narrator's personality, at least a, a little bit, and we can assess what we think of what the narrator tells. Sometimes the narrator can be an, an actor inside the story. Then we talk about a homodiegetic uh, narrator, which means that the previous one was a heterodiegetic narrator. When the narrator is homodiegetic, um, that, is, that is inside the story, we hear the story through the point of view of someone inside the story. The voice, this point of view, would then be a specific one and also a stable one. 
it is uh, it will not change throughout the story since it, since it is the one person inside the story who is telling the story. I'm saying this because we saw that as uh, that the external narrator, the heterodiegetic narrator, is less stable. As an external narrator, this voice has the right, so to speak, to present various points of view, as we saw with the number one ladies detective story. We hear uh, Mara Ramotswe through the external narrator, the heterodiegetic narrator. How did this happen? This happens by the use of free indirect speech which is the third option after the direct and indirect speech that you see here. So free indirect speech is a poetic technique, a particular use of language, which is used by the heterodiegetic narrator to create focalization different than the narrator's own focalization. So narrator, heterodiegetic or homodiegetic and focalization these are uh, narratological terms. First person, third person, direct or indirect speech, and free indirect speech, these are linguistic terms. Things in the language that can be used in order to create effects in the story, which we then call narratological concepts. Gavins does not provide a textual diagram for the number one ladies detective story, so we will skip this aspect uh, as well here and move to the last chapter from the book, which we will learn, which is chapter nine. Chapter nine talks about double vision. Govins uses this term to refer to metaphors. Metaphors were recognized as an essential component of human language and the evolution of human culture. And for us, this, uh, this is the final thematic chapter in the book. The one following is called Futures. And it is Gavin's talk about possible directions that the textual theory approach can take. We will not look into this uh, final chapter since our goal in this course is to learn concepts that can help us study Palestinian literature, in fact, any literature or discourse, and we are not looking into developing the theory as such. So this will be the final chapter of the book, which we will learn. Metaphors are used in order to speak about one thing in terms of another thing. Time is money is a very common example of this. In literary studies, they differentiate between a metaphor and a simile. Where in a simile, we indicate that we are making a comparison or parallelism, and in metaphor, we don't indicate it. Here is an example. I got it from somewhere in, in the internet, of course, but couldn't figure out whom to credit for it. I did, however, put the link below. So the simile says, on her first day of school, Jane was as cool as a cucumber. The use of the comparative construction makes this usage, usage a simile, as cool as. The metaphor, on the other hand, and on the right side says, Noah has a heart of a lion. And so we don't get any indication that we are now comparing Noah's heart to a lion in any way. In both cases, we know that we see a connection between two things, where one thing is talked about in terms of another. In the first case, a child is talked about in terms of a vegetable. And in the second, a child is being talked about in terms of an animal. We know that Jane is not a cucumber. We are told that she is like it, not it. In the case of Noah, we don't have any indication that Noah is not a lion. But we do know that we don't talk here about a real lion called Noah, but about a child who is brave. Here are some more examples. Life is like a box of chocolate, simile, because of the word like. My life is an open book. This is a metaphor because there is no indication of the parallelism. That baby is as cute as a button, as, as structure is a comparative one, so it is a simile. 
Maybe you are a firework. So this is a metaphor in spite of the linguistic register in which it is found. It is obvious that we recognize a comparison when it is indicated. But how do we recognize it when it is not indicated? How do we know that we are talking about a metaphor here? This is already a question that belongs to the realm of human cognition and to the study of human cognition. Mark Johnson and George Lakoff are linguists and philosophers, and they studied and wrote uh, in this book, Metaphors We Live By, that the use of metaphors is inherent to human language, and that we humans cast our experience from the material physical world into imagined situations and into mental concepts, mental spaces, mental times, etc. That is, when we imagine things, we use our physical experience to describe to ourselves mentally imagined situations and later conceptualized realities. For example, we think of knowledge and ignorance in terms of light and darkness. To have knowledge is for us to be enlightened and not to know what is happening is to be in the dark. We talk about a source domain, which is uh, closer to the physical experience. And by this, we understand the more conceptual domain, uh, the target domain. So light is the source. And according to this understanding, the more conceptual uh, object knowledge is the target domain. We have seen this a few times in this course as well, how using words which refer to physical experience strengthen the impact on the listener since so this is our as humans as, as as animals actually as human animals our uh, very initial and original experience here is a page from lakoff and johnson's book uh, where they refer to lexemes about happiness and sadness being up and down so up and down is the original is the the source domain um, as, and up and down is also true for our understanding of being conscious and unconscious, health, healthy and sick, uh, and other things as well. This is how we use our language, they say. Uh, this is how human cognition works. A supplementary to this uh, metaphor theory is conceptual blending theory developed by Fauconnier and Turner, which talks about the mind's ability to blend information from two distinct domains into one blended one. That is coming from a, a generic space here at the, at the top, uh, on top of this diagram, the concept of mental spaces and their blending and uh, looking into two domains, uh, input space one and input space two, and then blending them in the target domain of the metaphor uh, from, the, uh, from the, uh, the metaphor theory. The concepts of mental spaces and their blending are not only relevant for metaphors, um, but we will not pursue this issue further now. It is enough that we talked about metaphors and we mentioned this blending, conceptual blending theory. This text is from uh, the abstract at the beginning of the chapter. Gavin talks here about the way linguists work on metaphors. They are typically looking at a single sentence examples of uh, how metaphors are processed. Textual theory, on the other hand, focuses on larger chunks of discourse and can thus process what she calls, what Gavin's called, extended metaphors, and this is a, a known term. Gavin studies here an example of an extended metaphor, which we will also look at uh, here a poem in which the metaphor is not one instance of mapping one domain over the other, but it is developed throughout the discourse, throughout the poem. While the two domains, source and target, are dynamically developing. Gavin's example of an extended metaphor shows how a set of micro metaphors concatenated together into a mega metaphor are giving a different impression than only a single metaphor.
Let us look at the poem she studies in her book. Sir Walter Raleigh was an English gentleman, explorer, poet, and many other things. He was born in 1554 in Devon and beheaded on the 29th of October 1618 in London. For our purpose, it is important that he was also a poet, and here is one of his poems. Gavins relates to this poem because it is full of metaphors, but not simply many metaphors, but all the metaphors put together form a set of concepts around a common theme. Life is paralleled here to the theater, and various aspects of life are connected to various aspects of the theater. Let's first listen to the poem. What is our life? A play of passion. Our mirth, the music of division. Our mother's wombs, the tiring houses be, where we are dressed for this short comedy. Heaven, the judicious sharp spectator is, that sits and marks still who doth act amiss. Our graves that hide us from the searching sun are like drawn curtains when the play is done. Thus march we, playing to our latest rest. Only we die in earnest. That's no jest. This video is from 2012, before the term deepfake uh, started to be used. I'm not sure about the precise code uh, that was used here but there's a link to the original YouTube um, video and you can check it out if you are interested. I marked here on the text the aspects of life in turquoise, in green, um, and the metaphors of it, of the theater in yellow. So life is a play. Mirth, the liveliness, happiness, is the music of division. Music of division is a type of ornamentation of music that was done, uh, was, was used to be there in the 17th century. Mother's Wounds is the tiring houses, the place where actors uh, dress before the show, putting on their uh, bodies, so to speak, uh, before they are born. Heavenly Judgment is like the sharp spectators of the play. And like heaven mark the bad deeds that we do, so do the spectators. Whenever an actor makes a mistake, who doth miss? Yeah, that's in the poem. The graves are like the drawn curtains, as both hide the actor when life is uh, finished or the play is done in a metaphor. And here comes the line that makes the whole process of combining life and play more meaningful. Only we die in earnest. That's no, that's no jest. As opposed to a play, which is a made-up reality, says uh, Sorelli, life is real. It is earnest. This makes clear in a very powerful way the tragic situation of life, which cannot be reproduced even in theater, which imitates life. So this is a nice poem. And it also shows nicely why studying one metaphor at a time is not enough to understand the impact of the extended metaphor. It is only tragic if we see life and theater being so close to each other throughout the poem, only to separate dramatically, a metaphor again, at the end of the poem. In this respect, Gavin's criticism of the tendencies linguists show in their work is indeed correct. So to return again to Gavin's uh, criticism of the usually linguistically oriented manner of studying metaphors as a single lexemes or uh, as a sentence at the most, she says, Gavin says on page 152, Broadening the focus of analysis beyond the sentence level phenomena of the micro metaphors contained in the text to the examination of the discourse level phenomenon of extended mega metaphor allows the true sophistication of the emergent structure of the blended world to be uncovered. 
only an understanding of how our conceptualization of these metaphors contributes to an extended blended world can reveal the inclusion of far darker aspects of theater, pretense, frivolity, finality, in Raleigh's overarching metaphor. Raleigh wrote his, this poem when he was in prison in the Tower of London on the verge of being beheaded. Metaphors, says Gavins, create a mental representation, but this representation is not separate from the original text world in which it was created. As she puts it, whenever a metaphor occurs in a discourse, our mental representation of the text in which the metaphor was generated continues and normally remains the prominent focus of our attention. And after the mental blending is created, then, and here I quote her again, a concurrent blended world comes into being at the same level as the original text world. This means that uh, according to Govins, the world switch which is created by the metaphor is very temporary and the new blended text world returns to re the original level from which it was uh, generated. So there's no real world switch with regard to metaphors. So metaphors always feed back into the original text world. And so in, we are not working on the diagram of the metaphors either as we didn't do of the narrator because it is less important. It is more interesting to uh, describe it, not necessarily with a diagram. Now we will look at some stories from Gaza Writes Back. We will look at the, the various narrative techniques in some stories um, with regard to the type of narrator. The story Canary from uh, Nora Susi, which um, tells about uh, a young man who is uh, planning a suicide attack in a park in Israel and a young uh, woman who sees him um, and starts to suspect him and then uh, gives up on this. So here is a part of the text. He scanned the park nervously. He watched a small flight of birds, but soon lost interest as he could not identify their species. He watched a child who, trying to impress his mother, acted like a famous soccer player skillfully dribbling a ball. He smiled. He was in a similar situation before. He tried to convince himself that it was the right thing to do. Someone had to stay home, after all. His mother's promise gave him hope, and Gasson's support raised his morale. At last, his older brother believed in him. So we have here a third person uh, narrator, a heterodiegetic narrator, and in two places we can hear the voice of the protagonist, whose name we don't know, um, f behind the voice of the narrator. And here are the two places. So he watched a small flight of birds but soon lost interest as he could not identify their species. Um, this is something that uh, a third external person cannot really know why he lost interest. Um, so when we read this, we actually read the protagonist's uh, voice in here. So this is a focalized uh, sentence. It is told by the narrator but gives the point of view or the feeling, in this case, of the protagonist, not by telling about it, but by expressing it. Now he's saying, I'm not interested. I don't know what it is. I don't know what type of birds these are. So it's not interesting. Okay, and at the second sentence at the uh, lower paragraph, um, he tried to convince himself that it was uh, the right thing to do. Someone had to stay home after all. He remembers a period where his mother didn't let him come with her to pick up the food from the UN station in Gaza. So the sentence, someone had to stay at home after all, 
it is something that he explains to himself uh, not to be disturbed by the fact that he couldn't go or to be at least less disturbed. So it could be that his mother told him someone has to stay at home, but the after all words here sort of give the feeling that it is the inner voice of the protagonist. So here are two examples from the story Canary of focalization by the heterodiegetic narrator, so focalizing it through the protagonist. And here is a section from the story We Shall Return by Mohammed Suleiman. Um, as you remember, it is telling about uh, the, a group of refugees from Palestine to uh, Egypt, to Gaza. And these are the first sentences of the story. There were hundreds of people around him, and everybody was doing the same. Everybody was leaving, and all of them didn't he know where they were going. There was Abu Ahmad with his wife, his two married sons walking on either side of him, another two unmarried sons, and four daughters, followed by a line no less than that which followed Abu Ibrahim. Here again we have a heterodiegetic narrator who is telling the story in the third person. Uh, however, at some point, and this is the point you see in, uh, marked here in red, the voice is not a voice of a teller, teller, but it is the voice of one of the people here, one of the one of the refugees, and the way he thinks and the way he sees what is happening around him, and this is how he accounts for the um, for the people around him. There was Abu Ahmad with his wife, his two married sons uh, walking on either side of him, another two unmarried sons and four daughters, followed by a line no less than that which follow Abu Ibrahim. Abu Ibrahim is the person uh, speaking. So it, he's not speaking, he's, he's, the, 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 he's the focalizer. Yeah, he's the, 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 the voice whom we, we hear under the voice of the narrator. And so this is another example of focalization which is being done in a story from Gaza Writes Back. All right, now let's look into, um, into the story groups. Soon you will have to submit the work you've done on the stories of the story groups. You are asked to make a, a short uh, video of all of you of the group, not not this is not together, of course, but one um, uh, each one of you should be speaking. It's a short sort of presentation, yeah, which is done in the um, as the assignment, and I would like to hear your voices in there. Yeah, don't put other clips or anything else uh, in there; just your uh, voices and your uh, faces, and you are asked to analyze issues of identity in these stories. So we haven't talked a lot about identity, we talked a little bit. So as far as identity is concerned, you just work with as far as you know, what you know so far about identity. The, mo the main issue is that you can use now everything that you learn from text world theory to analyze the stories. So you can talk about world switches, you can look at where, what kind of world switches the protagonist or the people in the story create and what does it tell us about them and what is it, it tells us about their inner wor world. So what is their inner world and how from this we can learn about their identity. And so you can use the, the um, issues of uh, world building elements and function advancing elements they are very basic there's no need to um, to to um, concentrate on these or even not there's no need on concentrate on world switches as is only in so far as these things contribute to our understanding of their identity yeah so the technique of analyzing you have it already but it's not worth doing it just for its own sake. It is worth doing it as long as it contributes to our understanding of the story. 
and identity issues in it. As for your assignment, so there is no assignment this week because uh, you're not uh, you you need the time to do the uh, the submission of the story group. So this is your assignment. Uh, the deadline for submitting it is the thirty first of uh, March. So just um, yeah, as I explained uh, before, do the analysis of the of your stories in a group. This also serves as training for the final assignment of the course after we spend the second block talking about identity a little bit in general, uh, but basically about the identity issues of the Palestinians, special identity issues of the Palestinians. Thank you for listening and see you next time.